Hi everyone, and welcome to the Chapter 8 Lecture for Chem 100. This chapter is all about solution chemistry. So we'll talk about solutions, which are a type of homogeneous mixture. We'll talk about the different components of a solution, how they're formed physically and chemically, um, how to write equations for solutions, and then we'll do a bit of math on how to calculate concentrations of solutions. There's lots of different ways we can measure concentration. Um, we'll talk about creating dilutions. And then we'll come back, we'll bring it all around to why solutions are important in biology, in cells, and it, it has a role in um, osmosis and diffusion, how nutrients and waste get into and out of cells. Um, so I hope you enjoy my little chemistry meme joke here about solutions. All right, so a solution is a homogeneous mixture, so that means it is uniform throughout, and it's made up of two things or more. So um, there's a solute and a solvent. So the solute, by definition, is the thing which is in a smaller amount, and the solvent is the thing that's in the larger amount. Typically, we think of solutions as being a solid dissolved in a liquid, and certainly a lot of solutions we make are that. But solutions can be in any, any state, not just a solid into a liquid, but you can have a liquid into a liquid. You can have solutions of gas. So the air we breathe is actually a solution of uh, it's a homogeneous mixture of nitrogen gas, oxygen, carbon dioxide, um, lots of different gases mixed together. Um, you can also have solid solutions. A lot of jewelry is made from um, alloys of metals, so mixtures of two or three different types of metals, and so that's also a type of solution. Most of the solutions we'll be dealing with, though, in the class, we'll be talking about solutions of solids into liquids, or maybe liquids into liquids. So a very common solvent on planet Earth is water. And so any type of solution that takes that uses water as a solvent, we call it an aqueous solution, aqua being water. So aqueous just means a water solution. All right, so this is just showing you sugar, water, put them together, stir them together, and you end up with a sugar solution. It's homogeneous. You can't see the sugar particles, but they're in there. They're just evenly distributed throughout the water. All right, so a quick practice problem here, identifying the solute and the solvent. The two words look a lot alike. They're easily confused, so make sure you have the definitions down for each of them. So the solute is the thing in the smaller amount. So I'll say the solute is less than the solvent, okay? Um, so we've got a solution of nitrogen gas and carbon dioxide gas, 0.8 liters of nitrogen and 0.01 liters of carbon dioxide. So this one is the smaller amount, so that one is the solute. The carbon dioxide is the solute which means that the nitrogen is the solvent. I'm just gonna label the solute though. All right, here we have three tablespoons of vinegar and one cup of water that's used to make salad dressing. The smaller amount, the vinegar in this case, is the solute. And then lastly, in a piece of jewelry that is made of white gold, um, it's 90% gold and 10% nickel. In this case, the nickel is the solute and the gold is the solvent. All right, so this is also a good example of different types of solutions in different states. The first one is a gaseous solution, the second one is a liquid solution, and the third one is a solid solution. All right, so when solutions form, it's a physical process where um, molecules are not changing their identity. They aren't going through chemical change. They're just going through a physical change. So they're going from being sort of solid and stuck together to being separate and dispersed. And this happens through intermolecular forces that we talked about in the last chapter. So we know the golden rule of solubility like dissolves like, things will only be dissolved 
in, so a solute will only dissolve in a solvent that is alike, that has the same type of intermolecular forces. So polar solutes in a polar solvent, nonpolar solutes in a nonpolar solvent. Then the other sort of exception for polar is that polar things can also um, so, like uh, dissolve salts or ionic compounds. So um, in a polar substance in water, since we're focusing really on aqueous solutions here, um, if we dissolve a polar substance like glucose in water, it dissolves because those glucose molecules become surrounded by water molecules that are hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole bonding um, with that sugar molecule. And in a uh, salt solution where an ionic compound is dis dissolved in water, the ionic compound dissociates into its ions and gets surrounded by water molecules in engaging in ion dipole attractive forces. Okay. So remember, this is a physical process. These molecules are not being broken down. They are not, the glucose is not losing its identity. It's still glucose. Okay. They're, they're just separating um, into different parts. So this is uh, showing you sort of this process of a solute breaking apart and even becoming evenly distributed. And another word that we have for the solvation process or dissolving process, if water is the solvent, we call it hydration. So this is showing you what happens when salt is hydrated. All right, so solutions can be saturated or unsaturated. So a saturate, an unsaturated solution is one that has a little bit of solute in it. So there's, it hasn't maxed out the solute. So all of the solute is completely dissolved and evenly distributed. If you have maxed out the amount of solute that can be dissolved in that amount of solvent, then you end up with a buildup of solid particles or undissolved solute. All right, so a, a saturated solution is one that has the maximum amount of solute dissolved in it. And you may start seeing crystallizing of the, the leftover or sort of excess solvent or solute, sorry. So if this is salt or sugar um, that's in this solution here, we see this these crystals on the bottom and it looks static. It looks unchanging. It just looks like, oh, there's just a bunch of salt or sugar down here that's not dissolving and going into solution. But actually what's happening, if we looked at it at the molecular level, is some of that salt is dissolving into the solution while some other particles are recrystallizing. It's a dynamic process that looks like it's not changing because the amount of crystallized solid is constant, all right, because the rate that it's dissolving and recrystallizing, those rates are equal. And this is an example of equilibrium, of dynamic equilibrium, which we're going to focus a lot more on in chapter nine. It's a good thing to sort of whet your appetite for it here. So we can write equilibriums as having a sort of a two-way reaction. They are reversible reactions. So when you have undissolved solute, um, going into solution at the same rate that dissolved solute is coming out of solution or precipitating and forming a crystal, then you have reached this dynamic equilibrium. And this only occurs in saturated solutions. In an unsaturated solution, that would be sort of an, um, a one-way reaction where all of the solute becomes dissolved. All of the undissolved solute becomes dissolved. So saturated solutions actually play a role in some diseases. So that recrystallization process, if a solution has too much solute and it starts to crystallize, right? So some common um, diseases that are related to saturated solutions are kidney stones and also salivary stones um, and gout. So both of these are 
or all of these conditions involve crystals that form because of saturated solutions. So in gout, the crystals are of uric acid and they tend to form in soft tissues in the joints, particularly in the feet. And kidney stones form in the kidney, so the job of the kidney is to make urine, and so it filters out all kinds of electrolytes. And those electrolytes are, are basically just ions that if there's a high concentration of them, then they recrystallize as I, excuse me, ionic compounds or salts. And then those salt crystals, if they're large, um, can block the kidney, or sorry, the, the ureter, um, this, this vessel here that carries urine to the bladder. And um, because if you've, you know, seen salt crystals, they're, they're very, they have very jagged edges, they're kind of sharp, and they don't feel very good coming out of this ureter. So kidney stones are described as being very, very painful, even though they can be very, very small. They're very, very small, hard and jagged little pieces of solid trying to move through a very thin vessel that's very sensitive. Um, and so some of the preventatives for gout and kidney stones, one is to make sure you're drinking plenty of water because water is a solvent that will dilute those the concentration of these solutes. So that can help to prevent kidney stones. Also staying away from certain types of salt in the diet um, or certain uh, compounds in the diet that contribute to these crystals is also helpful in reducing the incidence of kidney stones. All right, so some factors that affect solubility, whether something will go into solution or dissolve in another thing. Well, the first we've already learned about, and that's the polarity. That's the golden rule of solubility, like dissolves like. So we know that one. But the two new ones that we're learning are the effects of temperature and pressure on solubility. So let's first look at temperature, the effect of temperature on solubility. So this is one that you're probably familiar with, if you whether you realize it or not, just you know from everyday life, from different beverages that you may drink. So for example, um, if you had a glass of iced tea or a, a mug of hot tea and you wanted to dissolve sugar in it, which one do you think would dissolve the sugar faster and better? Hopefully you said, and you know from experience, that the hot tea would. Sugar dissolves faster in a hot beverage than in a cold beverage. And we know that from real life experience, all right? So we will see that um, solid solutes do dissolve faster and dissolve more in, as the temperature goes up, all right? Here's another sort of real life example. You have two cans of carbonated beverage, two cans of soda. One is very cold, and when you open it, it makes a little whoosh, one is warm or room temperature, and when you open it, it makes a louder whoosh. Also, as you're drinking these sodas, the warm one goes flat faster, so it loses that carbonation faster than the cold soda. All right, so we'll see, this is a good example of the effect of temperature on solubility of a gas, carbon dioxide, in a liquid. So, looking at these sort of the taking these and making rules out of it for solid solutes like sugar salt temp increasing the temperature increases the solubility so think sugar and hot tea but for gases increasing the temperature decreases the solubility think of a warm soda losing the gas losing the carbon dioxide so a sort of explanation of why that is if we think of a soda um, let's say a soda bottle here and the orange balls are the gas bubbles of carbon dioxide all right when you raise the temperature those gas molecules are moving around even faster all the molecules are moving around even faster so more of those bubbles are going to actually leave the solution and enter that airspace and possibly even blow off that lid 
because they increase the pressure in the bottle. So because the temperature causes the gas to leave the solution, the increasing the temperature actually lowers the solubility of gases. So let's do a quick sample problem. Will the solubility of the solute increase or decrease in each of the following situations? First, we take sucrose, sugar, and dissolve it in water at 95 degrees Celsius instead of 20 degrees Celsius. Well, this temperature is higher, so that will dissolve it better. It will increase the solubility of the sucrose. Part B, a can of soda containing dissolved carbon dioxide is stored at room temperature instead of in the refrigerator. That's going to decrease the solubility of the carbon dioxide in the soda because gases, gas solubility decreases at warmer temperatures. So pressure also has an effect on solubility, but only on the solubility of gases. So it doesn't, sugar won't dissolve better or worse if you increase the pressure because it's a solid. Um, but gases will dissolve better if you increase the pressure. So if we look at this um, container with gas, these blue balls represent gas molecules. Let's again just stick with carbon dioxide. Why not? If we increase the pressure, we basically push more of those gas molecules into the solution and it increases the pressure of the gas in the solution. And this is called Henry's Law. Henry's Law is the law that states that the solubility of a gas in a liquid is directly related to the pressure of the gas over the liquid. So the more pressure you put on it, the more gas will actually dissolve in the liquid, which is why when sodas are made and bottled and canned, they are pressurized. That air space above the soda is pressurized so that there's a high amount of pressure there, which keeps those carbon dioxide molecules in the soda. Once you open the soda though, even if you were to reclose, if you opened a bottle of soda and then you reclose it and you seal it off so no more gas can leave, the soda will still eventually go flat. And that's because you've relieved that pressure. You've lost that pressure of gas over the liquid. And so molecules of gas will slowly leave the liquid into that airspace. So Henry's law is, in, not just important for keeping your soda carbonated, but it's also important, it's basically how you breathe. So when you, when you take air in, um, your lungs will naturally filter oxygen. Oxygen will move into the blood and carbon dioxide will move out of the blood into the lungs so you can exhale it. And the reason those gases move in that direction is actually because of Henry's law. If you look at the concentration of oxygen when you inhale, the concentration of oxygen in the air that you breathe is higher than the concentration. So the concentration of oxygen in the air is 160 millimeters of mercury. And the concentration in the bloodstream is only 100 millimeters of mercury. So the concentration of air of oxygen in the lungs is higher than the concentration of oxygen in the blood. So oxygen will naturally move into the blood. That higher pressure sort of pushes it into the blood. And then on the flip side, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the blood is higher than the concentration of carbon dioxide in your lungs. And so carbon dioxide will naturally leave and um, go into the lungs and then you can exhale it. So it makes for a very passive transmission of these gases. We don't need some mechanism to like filter out oxygen and carbon dioxide. It's just um, physics, basically. So a quick sample problem. Will the pressure of oxygen in the bloodstream increase or decrease in each of the following situations? The first one, a person climbs a mountain that's 10,000 feet high, and at high elevations, the pressure of oxygen in the air is lower. So if you hike a high mountain, you get up high, and the pressure of oxygen there is lower, so you're gonna get less oxygen into your blood. The pressure of oxygen in the bloodstream will also decrease. So that's why if you do hike at high elevation, some, there's something called elevation sickness. And part of that is because of the reduced availability of oxygen. Um, 
if a person is in shock and they receive mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation or they receive oxygen through a mask, that's going to increase the pressure of air in the lungs and that will also increase the pressure of oxygen in the blood. Um, and so that's how those, those apparatuses work. They, it's an increased pressure of oxygen that allows more oxygen to get into the, into the blood from the lungs. So when we're um, dissolving something, even though it's a physical process, we can still write equations for physical processes. Um, and all chemical equations have the form of reactants on the left, products on the right, and that reaction arrow that means they react to form. All right, so some solutes, when we dissolve them in water, will form ions, charged particles. And since charged things can conduct electricity, we call anything that forms ions in solution, we call it an electrolyte. So pretty much all salts, all ionic compounds, are electrolytes. So electrolytes are ionic compounds. And just a reminder of what ionic compounds are, how can you can identify them. Ionic compounds are made up of a metal and a non-metal. So any compound formula that's made up of a metal and a non-metal is going to be something that is an electrolyte. So sodium chloride, the classic salt that we use to demonstrate ionic compounds, it will dissolve in water. And sometimes we just put water over the, or under the reaction arrow um, to show that we're putting it in water. It is going to break up into sodium ions and chloride ions. And we say that they are aqueous. That aqueous AQ just means that they are dissolved in water, which is why we don't have to write water as a reactant and a product. We can just indicate that it's there through the presence of that state aqueous, being in an aqueous state. All right, so since each of these are charged, all right, it come and it breaks up into these charged particles, then we say that this is an electrolyte. Solutes that are um, covalent compounds covalent all right which are two nonmetals or multiple nonmetals just nonmetals only all right um, they do not break up into charged particles they do not conduct electricity so we call them non-electrolytes this is the formula for glucose. Glucose dissolved in water, all right? It was a solid, we dissolve it in water, it's still the same thing, but now we say it's in an aqueous state. It's dissolved in water, okay? So electrolytes can come in different strengths, strong electrolytes or weak electrolytes. So strong electrolytes, these are our ionic compounds, really. Um, and they will completely dissociate. So we say it's just a one-way arrow because all of the magnesium chloride is going to break apart into magnesium ions and chloride ions, okay? The exception to that previous rule is that, that covalent compounds are non-electrolytes. There are a couple of types of covalent compounds that can act as weak electrolytes. And the one that you need to know um, specifically are ones that contain this functional group here, carboxylic acid. So that's a carboxylic acid functional group, COOH. It's another way to write it. We'll see it as COOH. All right. And carboxylic acid functional groups, so they don't all break apart but for some of them, they lose that H group. So maybe 5% of these molecules will pop off a hydrogen, and then they'll have a negatively charged and a positively charged ion in solution, but it's not 
all of these molecules doing that was only a small percentage. And then some of these are reforming into this carboxylic acid. And so we see that this is a reversible reaction. So weak electrolytes are at equilibrium. They are reactions going in two directions and they can reach an equilibrium. All right, so the only weak electrolyte you need to be able to identify um, are these carboxylic acids. Otherwise, there are other compounds that can act as weak electrolytes, but you don't need to know the rules for finding them. You would just be told in a problem. Um, for example, the one that's coming up in the following slide. But first, just to show you an example or to illustrate this concept of electrolytes. All right, electrolytes, remember, are anything that carry a charge and can char carry electricity. So ionic compounds that dissolve are strong electrolytes because they break up into a bunch of ions and they can transmit electricity really well. And so this light bulb lights up really brightly. But weak electrolytes like um, the carboxylic acids, all right, many of the carboxylic acid molecules stay as carboxylic acid and only a couple of them actually break up into hydrogen ions and what we call carboxylate ions. And so since there's fewer ions or charged particles in this solution, it's a weaker conductor of electricity. So the light bulb's not quite as bright. All right, so it asks here in the sample problem, predict whether the following will fully dissociate, partially dissociate, or not dissociate. So essentially it's asking which one is a strong electrolyte, which one is a weak electrolyte, that's the one that's gonna partially dissociate, would be a weak electrolyte, and one that doesn't dissociate at all would be a non-electrolyte. All right, so again, just to go over some rules here, um, strong electrolytes that fully dissociate, we're looking for ionic compounds. Ionic compounds that are a metal plus a non-metal. Weak electrolytes, we're looking for a carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acid are the only weak electrolytes you're responsible for knowing. And non-electrolytes, we're looking for covalent compounds that do not have a carboxylic acid. So non-metals only. Okay, so let's look at this first example, A. Is it ionic, covalent? Is it ionic or covalent? Let's ask that first. Well, sodium is a metal and nitrate is made up of non-metals. Nitrate is a polyatomic ion, but still it's a metal plus non-metals. So this would be ionic. And that's not the answer because it asks, doesn't ask us which one's ionic or covalent. It asks us, will it fully dissociate, partially dissociate, or not dissociate? But if it's ionic, that means that it fully dissociates. The answer here would be fully dissociates. Now for sucrose B, C12, H22, O12. All right, these are all non-metals. Non-metals. All right, so that means it's covalent. And as far as we can tell, there is no carboxylic acid functional group. All right, there's no COOH pattern. So we can safely say that this does not dissociate. It's a non-electrolyte. And then lastly, formic acid has that COOH pattern in it, all right, which tells us that it is a weak electrolyte and it will partially dissociate. All right, so there's a couple ways that you could have these questions asked. It could ask, is it a strong electrolyte or weak electrolyte? Or it might ask, does it fully dissociate or partially dissociate, which are basically the definitions of strong and weak electrolytes. So when we write these equations for solvation or hydration, we still always have to make sure that equations are balanced. 
So if we are dissolving an ionic compound like magnesium chloride, right, the, the, it's going to dissolve into all of its ionic components. And remember that this formula here means that it's made up of one magnesium and two chlorides. I'll make the chloride solid balls, okay? So it means that this, this molecule is made up of one magnesium and two chlorides. So when it dissociates, it will dissociate into one magnesium ion and two chloride ions. So not Cl subscript two, but two individual chloride ions. So we're gonna practice writing some solvation equations for each of these. Write a balanced equation for the hydration of each of the following. One is a strong electrolyte, one is a non-electrolyte, and one is a weak electrolyte. So let's start with the strong electrolyte. We have calcium chloride. So I'm gonna write out the formula calcium chloride. And I also need to write out the states because they're important here, because these are, they're going through state changes. So those states are very important. All right. And then we can just write water, H2O, underneath the arrow, or on top of the arrow is fine as well. And it's gonna break up into its component ions. It's gonna break up into calcium ions and chloride ions. So this is a little bit gonna take us back to chapter three a little bit because we need to write the charges on these ions and how do we know what charge they're gonna have? We know because we know how to use our periodic table. So remember the group number in the periodic table tells us how many valence electrons things have. And the valence electrons will tell us what the ion charge will be. So calcium is in group two on the periodic table. I'm just drawing groups one and two here on the periodic table. Calcium is like somewhere down here maybe like right here on the periodic table, okay? That means that calcium has two valence electrons. If you drew the dot structure, it would look like this. All right, so when it forms an ion, it's gonna lose those two valence electrons. And because electrons are negative, that leaves calcium with a two plus charge. All right, so calcium has a two plus charge. Chlorine, um, on the other side of the periodic table, it has seven valence electrons, so it tends to gain one in order to, to fulfill that octet rule and have a full valence shell, so it has a negative one charge. And there's two chlorines over here, so we need to add a coefficient of two over here so that the equation is balanced. In other words, calcium chloride breaks up into one calcium ion and two chloride ions. And then the last thing is we need to make sure that we indicate that now these ions are dissolved in water. They are aqueous. They are not solid or liquid. They are surrounded by water molecules engaged in ion dipole attractions. They have been aqueified. That's a made up term, don't say that. Okay, the next one is a non-electrolyte. So non-electrolyte equations are really easy to write because nothing changes except for the state. So CH3OH um, is a liquid. This is methanol, in case you were wondering what it is. And when we dissolve it in water, H2O, we end up with um, basically just diluted methanol. So methanol that's dissolved in water or aqueous methanol. CH3OH aqueous. So this is the only thing that's changing here is the state. All right, goes from a liquid to an aqueous form. And then the last one here, HF, it tells us is a weak electrolyte. So you wouldn't know that looking at the formula because the only type of weak electrolyte I've taught you how to identify are carboxylic acids. Um, but in this case, it tells us that this is a weak electrolyte, so we're gonna treat it like one. So hydrofluoric acid is a liquid, and when we dissolve it in water, all right, it's going to partially dissociate. And since it only partially dissociates, 
we need to have that two-way arrow. So it's important to remember that weak electrolytes have a two-way arrow. All right, H2O. And it will partially dissociate into a positive and negative ion. And the positive ion will always be H plus, pretty much. And then the negative ion will be whatever else is left. Okay, so H plus and then whatever's left of is in this case F, fluorine. And fluorine has a negative charge. Both of these are dissolved in water, so we need to add that state aqueous for both of them. And now we we don't well we could check. Do we need to balance this equation? We do not. We have one hydrogen and one hydrogen, one fluorine and one fluorine. So it's already balanced the way it is. All right, so practice those. Students usually need a lot of practice writing out these equations. And you may need to go back to chapter three and review these rules for charges on ions, what charges they will have. All right, so the other sort of math of this chapter is calculating concentrations. So a concentration, the word concentration is just how much a solute is dissolved in a solution. And there's lots of different ways we can measure a concentration. There's lots of different concentration units because there's lots of different ways we can measure the amount of something. Um, we can measure the amount of solute by weighing it, the mass. We can measure the volume of the solute or the volume of the solution. We can measure number of moles. So there's lots of different ways we can define amount. And so there's lots of different ways to express concentration. So we'll, we'll only do the math for a couple of these. We're going to learn how to do the math for molarity and for percent concentration because those are very common. Um, but I'll just briefly go over what the others are and sort of in what context they're all used. So the first is milliequivalents per liter. And you will see this one used in healthcare a lot. It's used a lot for electrolyte solutions um, because electrolytes need to be balanced. You often hear that, like that you need to balance your electrolytes, all right? You want them to be electrically neutral. So you don't want your blood to be have too much, carry too much positive charge or too much negative charge. You want everything to be neutral. You want the total amount of positive charge to cancel out or balance out the total amount of negative charge. And so if you need to give somebody, if somebody has, um, you know, low sodium and you need to give them a solution containing sodium, you also need to make sure that there's negative ions in that solution to balance out the positive charge. And so since some ions have a plus one plus charge and some have a two plus charge, all right, this is a way to sort of um, keep track of the charges, how much charge is in solution so that you can make sure you're balancing it out properly. So it's a little bit different than concentration. So this is just looking at some different common um, IV intravenous solutions and their electrolyte concentrations in milliequivalents per liter. And you'll notice that the total amount of positive charge always equals the total amount of negative charge. So some of these just have a single cation and a single anion, but some have multiple cations. So this one has, the Ringer solution has sodium, um, potassium, and calcium ions. If you add up all of these though, it adds up to 155, so we need to have 155 um, total milliequivalents per liter of chlorine of the negative ion to make sure that that Ringer solution is neutral overall. All right, um, molarity is one that's used uh, very commonly in chemistry and in biology in laboratory settings. So not usually in a physiological setting in the body, you won't see it used a lot in a hospital, but in a laboratory set setting, it's it's practically the only concentration unit that's used. Um, so for this class, it's not particularly important to learn it in terms of um, for healthcare, you don't need to, to know it. So we're only gonna do very simple molarity concentration. 
calculations, but molarity uh, is represented by this capital letter M, and it is the moles of solute per liter of solution. So if you're given moles of solute and liters of solution, you can calculate the molarity. We would say that five moles of glucose in one liter of solution, we would call that a five molar solution, five molar glucose solution, okay? Um, let's do a quick sample problem. For molarity, we've got a solution that's prepared by dissolving 0.5 moles of sodium chloride in water to give a total volume of 250 milliliters. So I always say start out by writing your equation. Molarity equals moles of solute over liters of solution. I'm going to say moles of solute over liters of solution. Okay. So in this case, it tells us that um, we have 0.5 moles of sodium chloride and we're putting it in water. So I think it's safe to assume the sodium chloride is our solute. So we have 0 0.5 moles of solute. All right. And then divided by liters of solution. But notice that this unit is liters and that unit is important. This, it gives us milliliters. So we can't put 250 down here. We have to convert that 250 milliliters into liters. So 250 milliliters, all right? There's a thousand milliliters in one liter. One liter is a thousand milliliters. So this is our unit conversion here. Our milliliters cancel out and we get 0 0.250 liters. All right, and I'm gonna put that in the denominator up here. 0 0.25 liters. So 0.5, divided by 2.5 equals two, exactly. So we would say that this solution is two molar, the units of molarity is just that capital M, or you could say two moles per liter. All right, so the only type of sort of extra math that you have to do on these is potentially that it would give you the volume not in liters and you would have to convert it to liters. Or another thing it might do is it might tell you you have, it might give you two liquid solutes, like maybe you have um, 25, um, or maybe it gives you a couple of different liquids. It tells you how many moles of each you have and you'd have to, make sure that you put the right thing on the bottom here, that you're actually putting the volume of the solution, the total volume down here, liters of the total solution. All right, so um, another way that is very common to measure concentration is as a percentage. So the percentage could be percent volume, where you're measuring the volume of the solute and the volume of the solution. It could be percent mass, where you measure the mass of the solute and the mass of the solution. Or it could be percent mass over volume, where you mass the solute, but you take the volume of the solution. And so no matter which form you're using, when you're using percent concentration, volume is always in the units of milliliters, and mass is always in the units of grams, all right? The other key thing to pay attention to is that this this denominator is talking about the volume or the mass of the solution, the whole thing, not the solvent, not the solute, but the whole solution. Sometimes you'll find problems where they'll give you an amount of solute and an amount of solvent, and so you have to make sure that you add those together when you are making that denominator. So let's do a practice problem. 
uh, with percent mass by mass. So here's our example. If we have eight grams of glucose and we mix it with 42 grams of water, what is the concentration in percent weight? So glucose is the smaller thing in the smaller amount. So that's our solute, all right? And we're mixing it with water. That's our solvent. So it's not actually giving us an amount of solution. It's giving us an amount of solute and an amount of solvent. So when we fill in this equation here, we're trying to calculate the percent mass. The grams of solute, that's our eight grams of glucose, all right? The grams of solution though, is the eight grams of glucose plus the 42 grams of water. So eight plus 42, which is 50 grams. So eight, and then we gotta multiply it all by 100% to turn it into a percentage. And eight divided by 50, calculate those real quick, sorry. It, times 100 is 16%. All right, so this would be a 16% solution. And you, the key here is to remember to add those two together because it did not give us the grams of solution. It gave us the grams of solute and solvent and we had to add them together to get the grams of solution. Another type of percentage is percent volume by volume. This is often used when you have liquids, two liquids that are uh, making a solution. So for example, alcohol in water. So most alcoholic beverages uh, give you a percentage. So like wine is 14% by volume or beer, that's 5.6% by volume. All right, so those percentages are a percent by volume. It's how many, um, milliliters of pure alcohol are dissolved in that solution. So if wine is 14%, like this bottle of yellowtail here, all right, then how many milliliters of pure alcohol are in a 150 milliliter glass of wine? So in this case, we have some different variables. So in this case, we're given that percentage. So we'll plug that in here. We know the percentage and we know the total milliliters of solution. The wine is the solution, it's not the solute. Um, so our volume of solution of wine is 150 milliliters. And what we're trying to figure out is how much alcohol, this is our variable that we're solving for, our x. So we need to do a little algebra here and solve for that missing variable, the x. All right, so we can do that by, um, if we multiply both sides by 150 milliliters. All right, this is gonna take me a minute with my slow drawing here. So we multiply both sides by 150, so we can cancel this out, oops. And we are also going to divide both sides by 100 because we want to cancel out this. So we multiply both sides of the equation by the same thing, 150 over 100. All right, and that basically allows us to isolate x. So x equals 150 times 14 divided by 100 and that is 21. So x equals 21. 21 grams of alcohol, basically, in a 150 milliliter glass of wine. So the third form is percent mass by volume. And this is often used when preparing solutions with a solid solute and a liquid solvent, like preparing IV fluids. And um, it's just grams of solute per milliliters of solution. So this question asks us, how would you prepare 100 milliliters of a saline solution with 0.9% sodium chloride? 
So we've got 0 0.9%. And we want to know how we would prepare 100 milliliters of solution. So it gives us the uh, volume of our solution that we can plug in down here. And, and so what we're solving for is this x again here. How much sodium chloride, basically? What's the mass of sodium chloride that we need to use? So we solve for x. I'm not going to show the algebra here. Actually, don't really need to, okay? Because 100 and 100 cancel out. So x is 0 0.9 grams. All right, so in other words, and it's asking how would you prepare it? So basically, the right answer for this is you would take a flask, a special volumetric flask, and the first thing you would do is you would add your 0.9 grams of sodium chloride. Then, and this would be 100 milliliters. All right, and so you don't add 100 milliliters of water. Technically, you add water up to this line here, which is probably a little bit less than 100 milliliters because that salt does have volume and takes up some space. So the correct answer is that you add the solute first and then you add the solvent up to that final marker. But I'm not going to ask you a question like that. All right, here's uh, some more practice problems with percent concentration. What's the percent concentration of a sodium chloride solution prepared with 60 grams of sodium chloride and 500 grams of water? So the first thing I want to do is write out the equation um, for percent mass for mass, and then I can see what I'm plugging in to that equation. So percent mass for mass is grams of solute over grams of solution. Grams of solution. All right, so which is my solute? The sodium chloride or the water? Hopefully you said sodium chloride. So that's 60 grams of solute. And what is the mass in grams of our solution? Right? It's not the mass of the water. It's the mass of the water plus the sodium chloride. So your answer down here should be 560. Oops, I always forget to write this part. Times 100%. Right, so 60 divided by 560. Um, times 100% is 10.7%. So it would be a 10.7% solution. Um, how many grams of glucose are present in exactly 500 milliliters? of a 5% mass volume solution. So in a mass volume solution, we've got grams of solute over milliliters of solution. Solution. Okay, so we've got, um, our, in this one, it gives us the percentage. So the percent we already know is 5%. And it doesn't tell us the mass of the solute. That's what we're trying to solve for. But it does tell us that we have 500 milliliters of solution. So for percent solution, we keep it in milliliters. It's only for molarity that we have to change it to liters. So you will want to do some practicing. Make sure you get those straight, your units straight. All right, so I can do some simplifying here. Um, cancel out those zeros. 
So now I just need to multiply both sides by five. Multiply both sides by five. This five cancels out and we get that X equals 25 grams. So 25 grams of glucose in 500 milliliter, or that in, a five, in 500 milliliters of a 5% glucose solution, you actually have 25 grams of glucose. So like if you had a 5% glucose solution IV, which is a standard um, glucose IV, okay? Um, and you have, this is 500 milliliters, all right? If you had like nutrition facts on this label, it would say that there are 25 grams of glucose in this bag of 5% glucose solution. All right, some other units that can be used for concentration, parts per million and parts per billion. These are used for very, very, very dilute solutions. You see it a lot used for testing of water quality, looking for toxins, things like heavy metals, like lead and arsenic, um, are even very, very small concentrations can be toxic. And so, um, those things are measured in parts per million or parts per billion. Um, fluoride as well. A lot of water is fluoridated to uh, make for stronger tooth enamel. So all of this concentration and aqueous solutions um, are chemistry, but it's chemistry that's really important in biology because cells are full of solutions and fluids in your body. There's no pure water in your body. Water is like 60% of your body mass, um, but it's there because it's important for dissolving things. And these solutions also dictate how things are transported across cells. And the rules that govern transport of molecules um, are the rules of diffusion. So diffusion in physics says that if you have a high concentration of molecules, that they will naturally disperse or move from that area of high concentration toward an area of lower concentration. In other words, molecules like their personal space. So if they are highly concentrated and they can spread out, they will spread out. And you can see this in action if you just take you know, a cup of water and you add a drop of food coloring to it. And don't mix it, just add the drop of food coloring and you'll see it slowly spread out. And if you just let it sit there on the table, it will eventually diffuse throughout that water, um, even without stirring, because those molecules don't like to be highly concentrated. They will naturally move to areas of lower concentration until they're more evenly distributed. So, um, Osmosis is really the diffusion of water across membranes. So if you have a solution inside a cell that has a small amount of solute and therefore a large amount of water, the water molecules will diffuse across the cell membrane to the higher concentration solution where there's less water molecule. Osmo the definitions of osmosis sound really backwards because we just said that diffusion is movement from an area of high concentration to low concentration. All right, but diffusion, but osmosis is often said it's the movement of water from an area of, of um, low concentration to an area of high concentration. That's because when we're talking about concentration, we're talking about the amount of solute, right? So a, in this case here, the left side has a low concentration of solute. In fact, there's no solute, right? And the right side has a higher concentration of solute. But the solute displaces water. So there's actually more water in the low concentration solution, which is why water will go from this low concentrated solution to this more concentrated solution. Because it's actually water moving from a lot of water molecules, a high concentration of water molecules to a low concentration of water molecules. All right. Another way to think of it, and I've had a lot of nursing students in the past use this sort of, um, uh, what's it called, motto, that water follows solute. 
So whatever concentrate, whichever solution has more solute, is more concentrated, that's where the water will flow to. Water follows solute, and it does. Okay, so um, when you have a uh, high, when you have two different solutions of two different concentrations on different sides of a semi-permeable membrane where water can move through but the solute cannot, then you have a pressure gradient and we call this osmotic pressure. And osmotic pressure is measured in these special tubes called U-tubes where we can demonstrate it. So this U-tube has a membrane down here that is permeable to water but not solute. And so on this side you have pure water and this side you have a solution with solute in it. So the water will move through that membrane and this amount, the amount of solution will rise here. It will become more dilute because there's more water in it now, but eventually the water will stop moving through because the pressure of that solution pushing down equals the pressure of the water molecules coming through. So we say that the solution here on the right side is exerting a that this difference here is the is the pressure the osmotic pressure so that's how you measure osmotic pressure so the solution that has the higher concentration of solute is the one that has the higher osmotic pressure so when we look at cells different conditions of cells you can remember there's solution inside cells and solution outside of cells. So water will move in and out depending on the difference in those solutions. And ideally, you want water to be in a solution that matches, that has the same concentration. Sorry, you want cells to be in a solution that matches the solution inside the cell. So you want the solutions inside and outside of the cells to be the same. Um, that means that they're sort of happy. We see they're in an isotonic situation. Iso means same. We've seen that with isomers and isotopes. So isotonic means the same concentration inside and outside the cell. And when that's the case, water is moving in the cell and out of the cell at the same rate. So osmosis is sort of at equilibrium and the cells are happy. They're not taking on too much water or losing too much water. But if you put cells in a hypertonic situation, hyper meaning excessive, so the solution that the cells are in has a high um, salt or solute concentration, all right, then water follows solute and water will leave the cell and go into that high concentration solution. And when that happens to red blood cells, we say that they get, they become crenated. So they get dehydrated and wrinkled up and that's called crenation, all right? If you put cells in a hypotonic solution where hypo means below, so a lower concentration solution, then that means there's more solute in the cell. So water will move from the environment into the cell and cause the cell to swell and potentially to rupture or burst. You can actually do this on a microscope slide. You can put a drop of blood on a microscope slide and you can add a salt solution to it or add a water solution to it and actually watch the process of crenation and hemolysis in red blood cells um, live on a slide. The hemolysis is actually kind of hard to see because they they pop so fast. So you have to, if you use like just a very, very, very dilute salt solution, you can see it better. Um, but this is why it's really important that IV solutions be balanced and be isotonic to the solutions in the body. You don't ever want to put pure water in somebody's veins. That would be an, a hypotonic solution and that would cause hemolysis, red blood cell rupture. So when we give solutions in intravenously, they have to be in saline, which is a physiological P or the physiological concentration. So the concentration in your blood of salt, sodium chloride in the blood's concentration is 0.9%. And so that's the concentration of saline. It matches, it's isotonic to our blood. Same thing with 5% dextrose solutions. That's the um, normal so concentration of sugar of glucose in the blood dextrose is another word for glucose by the way 
Um, so diffusion and osmosis is also how our bodies work to get rid of wastes. In the organ that's responsible for most of this is the kidney. So kid the kidneys actually work by taking waste products that are in the blood um, so it in and uh, diffusing it. So the urine solution initially in the kidneys in the nephron it's very dilute and so there's a higher concentration of the waste products in the blood than there is in this you know urine and so it moves those waste products actually naturally move into the filtrate of the kidneys and into what becomes the urine and so people who have kidney disease and their kidneys don't function they can't effectively remove waste from their blood and so they have to do dialysis and what dialysis is is it's basically a filtration system that works just like the kidneys do where it takes blood out of the arm and it runs it through this filtrate where it has a very low concentration of waste and so the waste products from the blood diffuse out of the um, you know this coil here in the machine into the dialysis fluid and then the clean blood flows back into the body. So they actually pull blood out, clean it, and stick it back in, which is what your kidney is doing for the most part as well. So it's how artificial dialysis works. Um, a couple of sample problems to end the discussion here. A cell with a concentration equal to 5% glucose is placed in a 10% glucose solution. I like to draw pictures. So we've got a cell that has a 5% glucose solution inside of it. And we put it in a solution. Just draw like a cup here. All right. That has 10% glucose. And we want to know, A, in which direction will water flow to equalize the concentration? Well, water follows solute. It will go from the low concentration solute, low, lower concentration to the higher concentration solution. So in this case, water is going to leave the cell and enter that 10% solution. So water is going to flow out of the cell. Which solution is exerting the greater osmotic pressure? The one with the higher percentage always exerts the greater pressure. So in that case, the 10% solution. And will the cell swell or crenate? Well, if water is moving out of it, it will shrivel and crenate. Whatever, I'll just circle it, okay? Um, and then here's a question asking you to assess whether the cell is in a hypotonic, hypertonic, or isotonic scenario. So 3% sodium chloride solution, is that hypotonic, hypertonic, or isotonic? Well, that's a higher percentage than the physiological um, solution in the body, which is only 0.9%. So this would be hypertonic. It's higher than. So we're going to say this one's hypertonic, right? The normal physiological percentage is 0.9%. This is the same as our physiological body fluids. So this one is isotonic, and this one is 10 times less than, so it would be hypotonic. So remembering that hypo means less, hyper means more, and iso means the same. So, all of these different things so water osmosis is the transport of water across membranes but other things can get through remember they can get in and out of cells they just need a little bit of help so osmosis and diffusion are forms of passive transport water can move directly through the membrane um, but ions like and things like glucose and sodium ions and chloride ions they can actually move in and out of the cell but they either they need some kind of special protein channel to move through
So some things will move through a protein channel. They'll still diffuse, so they'll go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, but they just need a protein channel um, because they can't go straight through the membrane. Other things, though, will move in the opposite direction. So things can move in the opposite direction of diffusion. They can move from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration, but it takes energy to do that. And so we call this form of transport active transport. So passive transport, passive diffusion is for small things that can just go straight through the membrane. So like water and also a lot of gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide, they just go straight through the membrane. So they will always move in the direction of high concentration to low concentration. Facilitated transport is still passive. It's a type of passive transport. It doesn't involve any energy. It does involve diffusion, moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. But this is used for larger molecules that can't fit directly through the membrane and have to have a channel to go through. Glucose is the classic example here. When your blood glucose level is high, Glucose will move into cells, but it'll move into cells through these channels, these glucose transporters. Active transport goes in the opposite direction of diffusion. So molecules naturally want to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. That's if you sort of think of that as like a current, like if you're paddling down a river, all right, things are naturally moving in the direction of the current. If you want to go in the opposite direction, it takes a lot more energy. You have to paddle a lot harder. And so in this case, if you want to move things from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration, that involves energy. And the form of energy that we use in cells is ATP. And so we sometimes call these things ATPases because they have to use energy. Um, or sometimes we call them pumps because when you pump something, you're thinking of putting energy into it. So um, a last sample problem for you. In this figure here, all right, in which direction would passive diffusion occur across the cell membrane? So if this was passive diffusion, then it's going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So passive diffusion would occur in this direction. Passive, all right? But what if the question asked, which direction would it go if this were active uh, transport? Active transport would go in the opposite direction from the area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. So this would require some kind of active transport, okay? And that's the end of chapter eight. Thanks for watching.